you, Elizabeth. I appreciate that. You know, listening to these other amazing presentations, um, I was trying to pick, you know, something from each one to really support and emphasize. And in Dr. Furlan's presentation, um, what I got from it is that there's a lot we don't know, which is certainly true. And that despite that, self-management can be very effective, giving, giving the example of Ray Lynn. And then from Adam, um, I guess I can relate to him because like him, I've been on both sides of the gurney or the couch. And, you know, his symptoms are so typical, both of post-COVID and of that percentage, the 50% of people with long COVID who resemble ME-CFS, myalgic encephalomyelitis, chronic fatigue syndrome, with the pain, the sleep, the fatigue, and the brain fog, which he mentioned towards the end. And then, um, Tracy, you were so eloquent and really giving people hope that things are better if you have support of people who understand what you're going through. For my entire career, I've loved facilitating groups. So I've had groups of patients my entire career, and I could see the magic of how people come in kind of shut down and scared and maybe lacking in confidence because they've had so little validation and support. And once they realize that they're not crazy, that other people have some of the same um, experiences and symptoms as, as them, they just flower. And that alone can lead to improvement, right? Just feeling more confident and supported and hopeful. There's a whole literature on how um, mindset can lead to improved health. So with that being said, I'm actually going to share something completely different. When we met for our kind of preparatory meeting for this, sorry, let me try to move my cursor. Um, I was asked to give some really practical examples of what people could do. So to give people something to take away with them. Um, so that's what I'm gonna do. I'll just share my conflicts of interest. So like some of the others, I, um, and like um, Dr. Elizabeth just said, I have retired, so I'm not seeing patients one-on-one -on -one or in groups, but I'm transmitting what I've learned over the last 35 years through online courses. Um, I have written a manual and I find myself a reluctant researcher. So I'm actually the PI for a couple of grants. And it seems like, I uh, can't say too much, but it seems like another one was just granted to us very recently. So I'm gonna be quite busy on the research front. So the big message of this very short talk is that lifestyle optimization, AKA self-management, is really the critical foundation for improvement. Like all of the other speakers have said, we don't have any evidence-based treatments that work for a majority of people. We have treatments that are tried and tested over the past 40 years. That's kind of the length of time that people have been actively researching uh, ME-CFS, fibromyalgia, and much more recently, long COVID. And like Adam said, some medications help a little bit some of the time, but nothing is a game changer. But lifestyle optimization can make a very big difference. With guidance, most people can stabilize and improve their health. That's been my goal for my patients. And the message is there's hope. So my own story, very briefly, I was in second year of psychiatry residency in 1989. I got, I just thought I had the flu. It was nothing significant or really severe, but I just never got better. And I had all of the typical symptoms, fatigue, pain, uh, orthostatic intolerance, meaning a lot of dizziness, severe brain fog. I had to take time off of my program. Um, need to rest it for the first few years I was sleeping maybe 16 to 18 hours every day I would just get up eat a meal and just have to go back to bed and fall immediately asleep um, 
that shifts over time. So another thing maybe to emphasize is these diseases aren't the same throughout the course of the diseases. And so often sleep shifts, people are hypersomniac or oversleeping at the beginning, and they develop more and more problems sleeping as time goes on. So the first uh, step in lifestyle optimization is to figure out what's going on with your body. You can only do that by paying attention. You can do that by using a tracker. I have my aura ring, which has given me invaluable information that I never could have figured out without it. For example, about my sleep stages, or you can do paper and pencil charting. So uh, as you're going to see in the next couple of slides, some very specific things to keep track of. I usually say to people, make a list of your symptoms and pay attention to each symptom for two weeks. You can't pay attention to everything at once. You'll get hopelessly confused. So, for example, you might start with sleep and you might just record again using a tracker. How many hours of sleep are you actually getting? How many times are you waking up? Are you sleeping too early or too late? What's interfering with sleep? Adam talked about pain. So without that information, it's going to be very hard to figure out when you listen to a talk like mine or any of the other speakers, what things should you try? So accurate information, very, very important. And I'm going to give one example of how you can use that information in a really practical way. So pacing, uh, I've been doing this for a long time. I've myself, you know, had the illness for like 34 years and I've worked with thousands of patients over the past 25 years. And they tell me pacing is the single most effective self-management strategy if energy is your core symptom. Um, like Dr. Ferlin said, for MECFS and long COVID, energy is often a bigger issue than pain. So I'm going to just share some tips on how to prevent crashes for people with low energy. So the first step is to identify your energy envelope. So this takes self-observation. You need to know how many hours in a day can you do activities? And the number might be different for physical activity emotional activity like socializing or cognitive activity like doing banking or reading. Then you also need to know how long can you do an activity in one chunk before you start fatiguing. So say, for example, that through charting over a couple of weeks and paying attention to your energy, you notice that you have about three good hours in a day but you can't do it all at once. Say you've noticed that you can actually only do about half an hour of activity at a time, and then you start fading. So the next step would be, so you've identified three hours. Uh, you also want to identify when in the day are you most likely to have those three hours. For Adam, he talked about morning being his better time because in the afternoon he needs a nap. That's really important because if he continued to schedule appointments in the afternoon, you know, he would be exhausted and miserable. So then you want to make a list of the things you want to accomplish. And then you want to pick what is the most important thing and schedule that at the time when you know you're the most likely to have enough energy to complete it. So this isn't rocket science. It's quite simple but it can make a very big difference. If you know when your good time is and you schedule the most important things during that time and you break the activity into segments so that you don't overdo it, you maybe even use the tool of a timer that maybe you know that once you get into the activity, your chances are you're gonna keep going and ignore your early warning signs. Then you might wanna use your phone or some other device as a timer so that you don't overdo it. And then the last tip is to schedule rest and or relaxation before and after the most important, longest, most energy draining activity. So some people find if they rest horizontal, I call it preemptive rest 
with eyes and ears closed, not necessarily sleeping, but also not listening to music or podcasts, that you're really letting your brain rest and save up some energy so that you have it for the activity. You do the activity and then you rest again later. Chances are much higher that you're going to come out of that with almost as much energy as you went into it with. So those are the six steps that people find effective in pre preventing crashes. Now, I mentioned early warning signs. This is really important. So another way that self-observation can be helpful is to identify what symptoms for you, and they might be very individual, let you know that you're headed for a crash. Write the symptoms down because in the middle of crashing, you're not going to be able to bring them to mind, especially if you have brain fog. Put them in big letters on your fridge and make a commitment to yourself for your own self-care that you're going to stop at the first early warning sign. You're not going to push through. So why is that? Some people say, you don't understand. If I stop every time I have a symptom, I'll never get anything done. But the research shows that it takes longer to recover from a crash than it does to prevent a crash. So if you prevent crashes and every single day you have six 30 minute windows of activity and you scatter them throughout the day with maybe more of them during your better time and maybe only a couple of them at the time, maybe after your nap, for example, that means that every single day you have three reliable hours that you can count on. You can say to someone, you know what, I'm going to call you at four o'clock tomorrow after my nap, and chances are you're going to be able to follow through. Alternatively, if you push through and you ignore the early warning signs and you crash, anybody with severe fatigue, post-exertional malaise knows that that crash could take days to weeks to recover, and during that time you're going to get almost nothing done. So even though it seems like breaking things into small chunks is going to set you back in terms of productivity, most people report that in the long run, it actually helps them accomplish more. Now, another rule of thumb with pacing is pacing, the definition is to accommodate your activities to your energy, not the other way around. The research in MECFS, and I believe long COVID, it's looking very similar, is that the cells are not producing enough ATP. So if the cells don't have enough ATP, there's no way to hack that. You can't trick your cells into having more ATP. You can trick your brain into thinking you have more ATP by drinking a cup of coffee <laughs> or taking a dexagen, but that actually doesn't change the amount of energy that you have in your cells. So trying to push through and do a graded activity approach to slowly increase your energy has been shown to be ineffective. On the other hand, if you accommodate your activities to your energy, meaning that you change your plan if you feel more tired than expected, or you change your plan if you have more energy than expected, it can go both ways. The research shows that over months, so say a six month period, people who stay within their energy envelope start reporting higher energy levels. So if you can prevent crashes and prevent that long recovery period, chances are your energy may slowly improve over time. Now, my last couple slides here on emotions and mindset, several of people have referred to mental health. One of the things I've noticed is that because the narrative out there in society about these illnesses is so negative, and there's often a narrative that there's no hope, that you've, you're stuck with this, it's going to be for the rest of your life, and there's nothing you can do. People carry that unconsciously. They may not be aware that they carry that lack of hope. I'm not, I don't have time to go into it today, but there's very... Uh, elegant research showing that our mindset affects our biology at an unconscious level. So 
it's worth paying attention not only to your physical symptoms, but to your self-talk and your mindset. If you identify that you're carrying around a negative belief about your condition and your future, be aware that that is actually going to make it harder for you to recover because of the effect of mindset on biology. So my suggestion is each time you notice yourself falling into negative beliefs, make the decision. I call it opposite action. They call it that in DBT and I'm a psychiatrist and it's a very effective strategy. So opposite action means what would be the opposite of that negative belief and try it on. You might not believe it at first. You might not believe that it's possible to recover. But if you listen to people like me and you listen to people like Ray Lynn and all of the people she interviews on her website, you'll hear that it's true. There's many of us out there who are recovering. And I wanted to pick up on something uh, that Adam really reinforced to me, which is finding meaning and purpose. So if you get up every day and you have nothing to look forward to and nothing to distract you from focusing on your symptoms, chances are you're going to stay in this kind of negative, um, negative thought cycle, and that's going to have a negative effect on physical health. But if instead, even if you're not feeling great, you make an effort to find something that makes you feel interested, worthwhile, connected, contributing, creative activities are especially powerful. It's going to give you a little bit of a boost mood-wise and probably a little bit of a boost energy-wise. And you can actually create this positive vicious circle where you push yourself at first, you accomplish something, you feel good about the accomplishment, that gives your health and mental health a further boost, which motivates you to kind of try it again. So the bottom line is there are tried and tested science-based self-management strategies that you can learn and implement. I love what Tracy talked about. I really heard, I don't know if she used the word, but I really heard empowerment, like patients helping patients take back control and figuring out for themselves what works for them and being maybe less reliant on professionals. So I totally support that. It works and it's free. I also heard, uh, I think it might have, I can't remember who it was. I think it was um, Dr. Ferlin said, take baby steps, start slow and uh, start, start low and go slow. So I would absolutely support that. If you're very disabled, you've had very severe symptoms for a long time, you have to take baby steps to move ahead. And just reinforcing, there absolutely is hope. And I've created um, a special link for people who are watching this, uh, totally free, totally voluntary. If you click on it, you'll get a free handout, which summarizes the five steps that I have found over my years of experience are the most helpful in getting people started on that journey of recovery from these chronic complex conditions. Those will be followed up by a series of emails with short videos, again, just reinforcing some of the most helpful strategies.